So hi everyone, good afternoon, and today we are joined by Mushta and Dennis to answer some of the questions about next academic year. If you don't already know, Mushta is our Provost and CEO of Hero University Malaysia, and Dennis is our Deputy Provost of you know the same university, right? <laughs> earlier or earlier the week, we have sent out a survey to you guys to talk. To, to, to ask about some of the things that you are curious or want to know about the coming academic year. So we have concluded and summarized it into four topics. It's on RBL, on-site learning, online learning, as well as what are the values that we are providing. Uh, we'll talk about RBL first. Uh, Dennis, can you, we, we have been uh, sending out communications on what, are, what is RBL, Responsive Blended Learning. And with my time in uh, uh, as a president in the committee in most of some of the discussion, I know that RBL is not just a response to COVID, but rather a response to uh, something bigger. Can you share with us what is that something bigger? Yes, uh, Carlos, of course, I'm happy to share uh, with everybody. So in our learning and teaching plan, uh, which was launched uh, in 2008, along with our strategy 2025 uh, strategy plan for the university. We have already outlined our aspiration to have a curriculum that is uh, digital first, centered on the uh, you know uh, developing what we call Harvard graduates. So in there, we also outlined that this uh, curriculum or this pedagogy needs to be uh, focusing on inspiring learning, learning to learn, and on positive education. So uh, that uh, really is the plan in the making. So what happened to COVID is it accelerated our plan really. So now uh, each program or each course that we have at Harawat are now delivered by a global cohort. So regardless of you are a student in Dubai, or in Edinburgh, or in Orkney, as long as your course are delivered across the campuses, you will be uh, you will be handled by a global course team. Right. So this global course team is responsible to deliver a digital call, which means that there will be online activities, uh, materials for your pre-reading, videos pre-recorded to explain certain concepts. You can play, rewind, play again, and you know, at your pace. So every uh, student will study at a slightly different pace. Mm -hmm. Some of them have to work part time. Some of them have other carers' responsibility. So this digital core then help them to really manage your time to learn at a flexible setting. So this is always the ambition of the university to support students to be able to learn better depending on the circumstances. And um, we also um, in uh, the word responsive really comes when this um, you know COVID situation yep. many of us have carers responsibility we might have you know um, high risk group that we are taking care of we ourselves may be high risk either staff or students so by being responsive we can then uh, depending on the campus location depending on the students circumstances we can deliver a different blend to everyone so if you are stranded uh, now, being an international student outside of Malaysia, you can actually come when the time when the borders reopen. Uh, meanwhile, you follow the, the uh, you know the, the the lectures or the activities online. So uh, here in Malaysia, for the coming academic year, we have uh, part, uh, actually uh, uh, you know um, schedule a timetable so that you come to have face to face time with the uh, with us. But if you are unable to come on campus, you can follow those right, activities right. online as well. Before we move to more yeah. more detailed discussion on how returning to campus look like, I just want Mushtaq's opinion on how RBR would change learning and teaching for students, not just in this current climate, but in two, three years' time, how would that benefit students that graduate from here to what that has went through this? Yes. So uh, as, as, as Dennis has just said, the COVID situation accelerated our, our, our absolutely for, for change. So the things that we have realized through responsive blended learning is first we can work from home. We also can work from home. And also it, it showed us that with the right way of assessment, we can trust our students right. that they actually can take an exam on their own. Now these are things that stretched not only our imagination, but even the 
the regulatory framework, let's say in Malaysia, where we are, you need to come and then you need to sit for an exam. And I think really it's a matter of maturity, a matter of trust. And now we are producing all these professional professionals, the engineers and the actual scientists and the, the psychologists and the rest of them. And we trust that they have the knowledge, they have the capabilities. The, the other bit that is, uh, I believe, uh, a very strong feature of responsive blended learning is personalized learning. You know, education for, for, for maybe hundreds of years has been uh, done in a, in a, a sort of um, a massive way where we come and we assume that everyone will move at the same pace and will learn in the same way. But nowadays, with, and specifically with responsive blended learning, we are celebrating the diversity of our students, their different learning styles, different uh, needs. And this is something that we would like to retain, even when hopefully we find a vaccine and we go back to, um, you know, to what we call normal. The, the normal. And, and not to mention that with RBL, responsive blended learning, there's that focus on the learning. So previously you could come to a classroom somewhere and you could sit and daydream or listen to music or do, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't say you do it, but that's, that's <laughs> not possible. everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the, but the, but with responsive blended learning, now you really need to learn right. and you learn uh, independently. Right. And then the time, the face-to-face -face time is really where we do high quality interactions, mm -hmm. discussions, uh, working on projects. Uh, looking at things that uh, uh, you, you know we have doubts about, uh, stretch and stress our points of views and uh, points of views and and work together to to really achieve our full potential. So it's really the way of the future, and that flexibility is something that's being demanded in almost everything. And um, uh, we believe that this is the uh, the future of of education, and we are starting it. Today. That is what do you think here what it's doing right about about RBL or doing differently at least from other universities or competitors? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what we are doing right is we engage uh, with our students throughout this journey. Right. Um, ever since COVID has started, when we coined responsive blended learning, all the three student presidents are always with us in the uh, in, in all the meetings that we have every Monday. So I think that's one thing that we are doing right. What we're doing differently to other universities is we actually provide a lot of resources. Um, and if you go to um, uh, the LTA, Learning and Teaching Academy website, there are resources for staff, there are resources for professional services staff as well. And there are also now resources for students. So if you want to know more about responsive blended learning and what is it, uh, the, the gist of it. There are videos produced uh, by myself, Martha, as well as uh, Thai from Dubai. There's also a video by uh, Professor Guy Walker uh, explaining what it is in terms of responsive blended learning. And there's also animation that you can watch. Yeah, if I may add, uh, the other thing that would differentiate us remains our global presence. Right. So the fact that now we have global course teams working on these courses together will give access, actually unprecedented access to our students from all different uh, campuses to uh, various experiences because the the beauty and the diversity of our community is, you know, is what flourishes when we put it together and when we celebrate it. So imagine that having that people from you're doing mechanical engineering from Dubai, Edinburgh, and, and in Malaysia working together and, and the and the depth of, um, of of their industrial experience and personal experience as as they as they um, uh, support you. So this is, I think, uh, uh, very important and indeed uh, very uh, very unique for for our university. Right. Uh, can you go, Dennis, chat a bit more about how would RBL because it's a very modern way of looking at learning and teaching, mm -hmm. and I believe it's very transformative. To, to the sort of education climate around the around Malaysia, but how has the accreditation body been treating this this 
change. Okay, yeah. So, so I, I'm sure as a student, you'll be worried about you know, whether LBL will dilute your qualification or, or, or you know, accreditation and stuff, right? But rest assured that since COVID has begun, before LBL even launched, uh, university globally, uh, led by um, Professor John Sawkins, uh, has actually looked through all these uh, matters. So we have written to all our, we call them PSRB, Professional Statutory uh, Regulation Board, reg Regulatory Bodies. And we wrote to them and consult with them and telling them that we are doing this. Okay, are you okay with it? Is there anything additional that we need to do right, to right. ensure that our students, our degree remains accredited? So with regard to accreditation, I think you do not, uh, I mean, all students don't need to worry about it. Um, in fact, our uh, Malaysian Quality Agency has been very liberal in their approach. Mm -hmm. They are very supportive. They right, came up with guidelines and they tell you that you know they understand this is unprecedented time. You are allowed to innovate and really the key point is no student should be left behind. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. Yeah. Mushpa so spoke a bit about trusting the students to be able to understand the, the courses on their own and take the exam responsibly. Uh, can you share with us how would assessment look like for students that are going through this uh, sort of on online event, especially for students, international students that won't be on campus, that will not have traditional sort of sit down in the hall exam. So the university has also decided um, there will be no in-person examination from now until end of December. Right. So uh, in LBL, we also will put a lot more emphasis on continuous assessment open-ended um, you know uh, examination or assessment and uh, we still have, will have take home exam but it will be open book take home exam uh, so it will be written in a very uh, new way um, that of course students will be given ample practice before we assess you and we also put more uh, thoughts in terms of innovative ideas for example will industry be part of our uh, assessment um, you know assessors uh, rather than just uh, academic staff alone so these are the innovation uh, that we are looking to individual course team we let them to uh, decide what is best for the course because they are the subject experts, yeah. So they will know what is best for the students. And at least these these, uh, these exams, yeah. because they are open ended, open book, they actually resemble life more than working maybe life. the working life more than the traditional uh, mm -hmm. exams. So I, we welcome really that push that that we are uh, uh, and the challenge that that's thrown at us by 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 this global uh, pandemic, so that we could stress some of the ideas that maybe in the past was quite difficult for let's say MQA to accept that right. a mechanical engineering student, student takes a paper with her or him for 24 hours and work on 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 a design project with, absolutely but think about it when you work when you go out and get a right. job you will have access to Google right so why do why do we remove something that you will use when you work from you and I think it's it's really about a matter of innovation, imagination, and also trust. Right, yeah, wonderful. We move on to topic two, which is on-site learning. So we have been hearing things from the government, things like we have 30% 30, 30 capacity on the campus. Uh, we need to get approval from the school when we come back. We need to take QR, scan the QR code, scan temperature. So, so what can students expect when they want to return to campus? So yeah, so the 30% cap, Carlos, I'll pick, up, I'll pick that mm -hmm. point out first, is really, um, you know, um, to be compliant with the directive of the um, ministry. So the ministry has prescribed a 30% cap for all uh, private and public universities from July, June until the end of mm -hmm. September. And in alignment with the public December, university, you mean? Uh, uh, September, September, next September year. this year, this year, September, and in line with the public um, university reopening by October this year, there will be no cap. So really, you know, the cap is being put in place. Just um, you know, for the prior students, uh, in terms of actual learning time, it's about two weeks. Yeah, mid September until end of September. Right, right. After that, you know, we will not partition the uh, well, we, the uh, timetable has been partitioned, mm -hmm. but really there's no restriction on whether you will be here on Monday or Friday. Right. So you can uh, have uh, full access to the uh, campus facilities by October. So we just 
uh, requesting students to be patient for that two weeks time uh, while you're back on campus, which can be a bit uh, restrictive. If you watch the video that uh, was released last week, together we can stay safe. Right. We acknowledge all the inconvenience for that two weeks, but then after that, it's pretty much life as normal. But the campus will be open Monday to Saturday, 8 o'clock until 6 o'clock. And again, that is to be comply with government uh, and SOP. SF, SOP. Rather than we want to restrict student access. Right. And whenever the SOP changes, we will make uh, assess the new SOP, do gap analysis, and we will re reassess the situation again. Um, also, uh, when you come into campus, you know there will be temperature sc uh, scanning, mm -hmm. and we only currently open two main entrance, one at East Wing and one at West Wing. Right. So whenever you exit either of the wing, if you are not using the Sky Bridge, then you have to be uh, um, re temperature checked. So we have also invested in a thermal camera, which is like mini seconds response. I know you've been to a supermarket and you, you take forever to get your temperature scanned. It's yeah. very different, but yeah. this Plus, one, yes. uh, stand in front of it. If you're not wearing a mask, it will remind you to put on your mask. Wow. And it will give your temperature within milliseconds. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, we have a bit of questions with regards to what platform would Abia be using, but I'll actually hold on to the questions because we've been talking about uh, online learning a bit. But I would just like to clarify with Dennis. It, what, what Dennis was saying was that we are encouraging students to be back, but in line of student well-being and, and their health, that's why we are following the SOP of 30% cap and splitting you into uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday morning and the rest. So. Yes or no answer, students will be able to access campus as they wish come October. Yes, yes, yes. The, the, health, the health and well-being of students and staff are our utmost priority. Right. So we have been, if you, if you watch a video uh, last week, you have been seeing that all the efforts of staff putting in to ensure that the campus is safe and clean. Uh, we sanitize three times a day uh, at high frequency point, we provide wipes, uh, where in the computer labs and stuff like that. So really, uh, you know, we are doing our best to make sure that the campus is safe um, for everyone. Musha, what would be the plan B in case of a second wave or another MCO happening? Thank you. This is a very good question, uh, Carlos. And I think while we are very optimistic and full of hope, we need to be realistic. And uh, it really depends on the situation, to be right. very honest with you. but. Worst comes to worst, we may have to close again if the whole country closes down. Mm -hmm. But now we have all the experience right. behind this because we have done it. So we know how to do it. We know how to go uh, to, to that situation very quickly. We hope we, we won't need it. But should that be the case, you will receive an email from me telling you, please don't come back tomorrow. And then we will take care of, of everything that as we did in the, in the, in the first time. Would the daily YouTube I'll be back. Well, I think that if, you, if, you, <laughs> if that is needed, then I'll do it. Yeah. So I'll I'll, I'll do it. I just want. Yeah. We have received sort of a, a feedback that they appreciate somebody is looking out for them during that whole whole period. And 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 really, I just want to say I I say thank you for our students for that positive feedback. Dennis, can you? Sh we we talk, spoke about having them partition them into uh, one group. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday morning, and the other, the rest. Can you give the students a sneak peek of what their timetabling would look like? Okay, I think from memory, Monday, Tuesday, and mid, until midday, Wednesday, uh, we allocated the uh, time for EPS, um, EGs, and foundation students. And after that, uh, the remaining of the slot from midday, um, Wednesday, until Friday uh, are allocated for source, source and max students this is only for face-to-face -face, uh you know classes right but for non-face-to-face -face classes they go monday to friday mm -hmm. for postgraduate classes they are uh scheduled on saturday right and uh just uh for you guys the face-to-face -face classes are called face-to-face -face classes and not tutorials because we are changing what we are doing with yeah. how we label the, the the sort of sessions can you give the students a bit of what what was lecture before what is it now 
and then what was the third before? What is it now? Right. Uh, I think Mushtaq have sort of alluded to that yes. just now. Yes. Uh, uh, quite quite a fair bit. So really, because uh, you know, in the past, you might have experience where tutorial is, uh, you know, you you will be given a piece of uh, work to be worked on, and you know, we think do small group discussion and stuff like that. So, but now because you have this digital core that you learn at your own time, the the face to face classes are now being, uh, you know, reinvented. So you'd come for uh, probably there will be a mini lecture. Probably there will be a flip classroom activities that you'll be asked to give a summary. Uh, maybe Carlos, if you're in my class, I will ask you to I'm lead not the class. Yes. Uh, you know, for for five ten minutes, then you know everybody chip in, and there will be also the traditional quiz or uh, you know the uh, tutorial where you have questions that you try to work up mathematically or try to have case studies. But the more important thing is during this small group because this face to face time are small group teaching time. So we will be able to offer more personalized approach. We'll be able to hear you out more uh, uh, closely. At the same time, don't forget there's also a bulk of learning that takes place online in the digital discussion board, where uh, there will be, uh, you know, we what what centered to this our our big idea is the learning community. So we want to establish a community of learners. <clears throat> so between the te- among the students and the teachers. They should have this regular community. I mean, I know we all spend a lot of time on Facebook or Instagram or even um, Snapchat or whatsoever. So we want to, uh, you know, bring that element into our learning community right. so that we stay close through this online interaction and enhance those experiences in our face-to-face teaching. With that said, I have a question here: When would face-to-face lecture be held again uh, for the next academic year? Uh, the short answer is maybe never, <laughs> because we are changing the way that we teach. Right. Okay. So we we are really trying to accelerate the way that we teach, and the face to face lecture. As much as I said, this is like two hundred years old kind of teaching methodology. You just like you attend, a, you know, a church service or something is preaching. Sometimes your mind can't help but wondering. So we really want to bring everybody with us on the journey. That really, you know, it's a small group learning. Yeah. Remember, in, in, in when you're younger, the best way that you learn is to get your hand dirty. Right. Yeah. Right. So we really want to uh, have everybody engage in that kind of uh, immerse in that kind of learning environment. So, if, so if I were to just give an example, uh, you know, we 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 started uh, the foundation program absolutely digitally online yes. no lectures we started in april and it was a huge success so one of the uh, uh, lectures was a lecture about uh, exchange rate and traditionally the lecturer would come and he would show slide after slide showing exchange rate and how do we price uh, currency and and things like that right so what we did we have converted this lecture into an interview between him and the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank. Mm-hmm. And through the conversation, just like the way that you are so skillfully at leading now, we we teased out all the learning bit. Right. So the students had to listen and then answer questions based on how did how how was the interaction uh, with the CEO. And I think through that, first the students will feel that this is really le- real learning from a, a, a CEO of a, a major bank. Yeah. Now, maybe when the pandemic is behind us, we will get the CEO on campus to be interviewed by the students and the staff, right? But let's stop thinking someone will come and give me the pieces of knowledge and I go and then I prepare for them and then I go right. and take uh, an exam in, right. in its, right. in its uh, uh, normal or, or traditional uh, way. Right. And and I think the more we, we go through this process and the more we become comfortable with it, and then I really believe that even the industry will feel that this batch is different. <clears throat> it's different because they've been through adversity, they are more resilient, and, and all of these additional very important skills Will 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 uh, will be embedded into our uh, uh, graduates. I will be moving towards online studies. Uh, we have like we had a questions just now when we were talking about RBL. What platform 
would it be hosted on? So, so you spoke about uh, the foundation earlier. Can you uh, let us know what platform they are using because it's not Blackboard and it's something really fun. Uh, yes. So the 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 uh, foundation is uh, uh, was hosted on a platform called Open Learning, and uh, we were able to do this because the foundation in Malaysia is quite unique. It's mm -hmm. run only in Malaysia. Right. And uh, it is. Uh, you are right. It's a it's a it's a platform that we are experimenting with. It costs us quite a bit of money to to do, and we are we continue to invest in in that. And this is a part of a bigger project that we call the Global Foundation College. So as a as a university, we we as I said, continue to experiment with um, with different um, uh, platforms. We are using uh, Blackboard. We are using uh, Vision because this is a global. Uh, right thing and and we need to do it um, through throughout but as we as we move on uh, i think uh, we need to uh, remain open minded to the uh, what the technology brings and we have been investing actually heavily into into technology and um, and, and and so on so i i uh, uh, it will not be on uh, open learning it will be vision but the really the major uh, change is having that one global course site which we did it only you know this year and i and i think again one of these things that we had to do and it was accelerated by covid i'm happy to put this to add to that. yeah yeah so so um we will be using vision and the digital classroom will be blackboard collaborate ultra bbcu as they are probably called now they maybe uh, there are also some um, um you know informal discussions will take place in vision but we're also utilizing more features of um, Blackboard now, or Vision. So the, the discussion board is one thing that we've been talking about. There are actually many, uh, you know, features inside Blackboard that we didn't explore previously because, you know, it was not the sort of main, you know, thing. main thing. We were really focusing on face-to-face -face delivery, mm -hmm. but the uh, move to digital delivery has now unlocked all these features uh, now staff are being made aware of it, so uh, Learning and Teaching Academy has gone through the whole summer running batches after batches of uh, what we call introductory to a responsive blended learning, a module to develop staff further, to help staff to use different tools um, within the uh, you know, BBCU, for example, digital uh, whiteboard, uh, real-time poll, uh, using chart and breakout rooms. So right. with all these things in place, um, um, you can really you know, replicate what is in the classroom and you can also do things that you couldn't do in the classroom before. Right. Yeah. So if prior to this, you know, you want to have a real-time poll, you need to have a third-party app, you know, mm, you know yeah, to get yeah. students mm. in. Now it's all integrated. I would like to give you, I mean, not to, not to talk bad about BBCU, but in, in the, the thing that I've gotten here, there are opinions that BBCU might not be user-friendly. <laughs> and, and I have actually personally uh, experienced this when I was doing a, a orientation with the July Foundation batch. Um, there are sort of a bit of bugs and kinks to be worked out from BBCU. Do you see that as something that will impact student experience or compromise their learning and teaching? Uh, about a dip also depends on the bandwidth for students. Right. I think if your home bandwidth is a bit, or you're doing it on a mobile phone where you're connecting not to Wi-Fi, uh, of course the experience will impact it. Uh, in terms of the user friendliness, I think there's, with any platform, there will be a bit of a learning curve really. Uh, but I think with the training that we've given to staff, now the staff themselves are, you know, competent in delivering this on BBCU, they might they are able to offer help more real time uh, than before. So right. I'm quite hopeful that the experience will not be uh, impaired um, um, unless there will be you know uh, internet connectivity issues. So that wouldn't work with any platform at all anyway. Um, of course, there will also be uh, you know if if teams. Um, um, uh, more preferable and it's for a small group of students I think then maybe they can use that but the teams do not have you know real-time right. call they do not have breakout rooms right that's the main difference between teams and BBCU
right? The main concern about going fully online, uh, especially for the students that are unable and uncomfortable with returning to campus or face-to-face -face learning and teaching, would be it would lose the sort of connection that they built physically, like this talking to the lecturers, and they will lose a bit of engagement in their classes. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I I actually have to agree because I think there's nothing like really looking someone in the eye being you know with them in a room because you could and and these connections are very important but what is even more important is health well-being right. of our of our people so uh, responsive blended learning is to provide for that because think about it even if you choose to come on campus and even if you choose to come every day all you need is a bit of flu or a bit of temperature and we won't allow you on campus right and that's why we needed that alternative you know uh, mode that is available should you cho choose to to uh, to to do it uh, to do it online so i uh, i i agree i personally uh, am looking forward to to the time where this is behind us so that we can go back to shaking people's hands and, and having that connectivity because it is ex extremely important. With that said, uh, are there any supports that are in place for students that are not able to come back, unable, not comfortable with coming back? Uh, sort of, if, what, what support does, does the school offer to students that are doing the, their courses fully online? So besides the, uh, the academic support, because our promise really is if you choose to take the entire thing online, you should be able to progress as you know as per advised uh, advertised but the the uh, the uh, the additional bit is uh, there is a lot of emotional support there is uh, there, are, there were my videos for example yeah, <laughs> I, I see them as part of that yes yeah but, but, but beyond that really our uh, our uh, 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 counseling services and all of that remains available should people want uh, or need that kind of uh, support because we really believe that as leaders in positive education at the end of the day if you are not hopeful if you are not positive you will not be able to work, learn, and, and progress in life. So that message of positivity, that message of you belong to a global university, a global uh, global community that will be here to support you, for you. And uh, the moment the borders are open, we are looking forward for Go Global to, to be reinstated. And for us, even as staff, to travel and see our colleagues from other campuses, so uh, all of that uh, remains. Uh, Dennis could add, but uh, the uh, personal tutors will continue to provide uh, that support that we that, that they do uh, for for our students. Um, you know, as part of our Empower program, we 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 spend quite a bit of time working with our uh, students as they start to think of their impact and document their impact statement and we are going to do that right uh, to the to the new batch of, of, of students so all of that uh, remains uh, remains there uh, for our students to be supported i don't know did i miss anything yeah yeah i, I think it covered most uh, everything but it's also as a heads up to uh, our students out there we will be working with partnership uh, in partnership with USA to have a lot of social activities and half well of course a lot of these activities will now be carried online so yes. that we, uh, we will engage everybody uh, across uh, uh, the different parts of the world in terms of personal tutoring uh, there is a guideline uh, you know more support material for our personal tutors uh, we will be also increasing the uh, touch point uh, between a students and the personal tutors so this is uh, now being made available and well uh, across campuses we are now also introducing consolidation week it's a new thing that uh, you know some schools use a reading week some school used to have consolidation. We now will, uh, worldwide, across all programs, all courses, week six of the semesters will be consoli consolidation week. This is a week that we have you know, mental uh, support, uh, well-being support uh, activities. We will have uh, personal tutoring, we have impact statement workshops to, for new students. We will be also, uh, you know, students who uh, um, probably require more time to 
uh, really because of the pandemic, everybody will be at different places. This is a play, uh, place that for them to reconsider that, reach out and catch up with their studies. Before we move on to the next topic, just one last question. How flexibly can students switch between uh, on-campus learning and online learning? Uh, for example, can we one day, today I wake up, I don't want to come to campus for classes. Can I just say, no, I switch it off and then I go online in, in, in my room? Yeah, so I, I, will, I will answer first, then Musha can come in later. Mm. So uh, the ministry requires us to give you an approval letter to be present on campus. So that's why registry has sent out an email to ask students to elect their mode of study. So once the semester has started, so for any reason, for example, international, if you are arriving late, uh, not to not to worry, you can uh, inform the school that you have arrived, you serve the quarantine notice and so on and so forth. You can then join campus. If you are on campus students and for some reason you, have, uh, you felt sick and, and, and you need to change your mode of study, just inform your school and we will provide the necessary transition. Uh, the reason why we require you to inform the school for approval is so that we can support you better. So I cannot one day say this one, one day say this one. For, for the experiences and also for right. in terms of us monitoring, uh, you know, for safekeeping everyone on community, we need to know where you are and right. also also how, yes. how uh, you know, um, you know, you could be fallen yeah. sick and then right. actually you, you, you didn't appear it's just because you changed your mode of study and we might be worrying sick that you are not feeling well, are you okay, you know, your personal tutors then have to reach out to you. Right, right. You know? yeah. To move on to the last topic which is values. Now, we, from the survey, more, there are students that, that, that comment that uh, the university sort of went into lockdown and then nobody nobody's is on campus and then we must have saved a bit on electric fees and water fees, utility bills, right? And then uh, students are not given access to campus at this moment. What was the conversation around our tuition fees? Uh, uh, why wasn't there a reduction in our tuition fees? So this is a question to Dennis, right? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Never mind. I take the difficult one. This is actually, actually is not difficult at all. But thank you very much for for, for bringing this up. Uh, as you guys know, Heriot University is a charity. As a university, we don't exist to make profits so that someone else becomes rich. We just uh, want to balance the books and have uh, resor enough resources so that we can. Um, uh, invest in our student experience. So, in Malaysia, we are mainly funded by the tuition fees. And half of our revenue goes to, to staff salaries. And, and this remained and, and changed. Around 15% or so will go to our to cost of our rent and, and utilities and, and things like that. And rent hasn't hasn't changed. We didn't get right. any any reduction from the landlord. As a matter of fact, people think that during a lockdown you don't use electricity. But trust me, we even had to turn on the air conditioning regularly. Otherwise mold will grow on books, on our furniture, on 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 um, uh, and in our offices and classrooms and be very difficult to clean it late, later because this is a very hot and very humid country yeah. as you all uh, know so was there a bit of saving on water and electricity absolutely very little very very little uh, the the remaining is uh, you know the investment in library and books and softwares and so on but let me tell you about additional costs that we've incurred we have we have to pay around half a million ringgit to, you know, to use some some new platforms for an, an experiment with them. We've just refreshed the internet on campus because we need that. It costs us a million ringgit. If you come and we are looking forward for you to, to come on campus, you will see all the sanitizers around and the scanners and that costs us quite a bit of money. Uh, when, when we went into lockdown, our students around the world who stay in our accommodation said we want to go home and can you please let us uh, you know go off our uh, contracts without uh, without um, uh, any 
penalty. cost or penalty to us? And we said yes, cost us, you know, multi million ringgit worldwide. And same in, in, in Malaysia, because as you know, we don't own the, the accommodation here. So we have been really uh, investing, and our uh, cost of running the, the show has increased. Uh, we have purchased laptops to all of our uh, academics, and in, starting September, everyone will be on laptops, and we have to purchase additional equipment for them to be able to illustrate all of that. Uh, are, uh, uh, all of these are investments. Now, the, the fact that we had to run face to face and online simultaneously together, all of that is additional cost and additional work to, uh, to, to our staff. So, trust me, there's, there's, we did not save, we potentially actually paid more. And our utmost priority here is to keep the community healthy and safe and also for you to complete your studies on time so that you can go out, get a good job, you know, make us all, all, all proud. This operation, it's very important for it to remain sustainable so that we have a university and we take care of all of you and hopefully something remains so that we could invest in the things that we are passionate about the areas of like student activities and, and, and HOMSA and, and, and so on. Um, so, so all of these things are really happening and it's good that you've asked so that we could explain it to, to our students. Not to mention, uh, we are also committed to, uh, to our scholars. So there are students whom, you know, we, we pay quite a bit of our uh, uh, revenue as uh, scholarships for high achievers and and uh, women in engineering. And these are all investment that the university is strategically putting to attract more girls into engineering, which is a global agenda, and also the, the best and the brightest to come here to call Harriet Watt University their home. I would like to switch the conversation around fees to, instead of why are our fees not reduced, rather what is the university doing to add value to to, to the money that we are paying for our degree. Yeah. As we have been talking all uh, right. ab about this, we are, we believe that our students to be successful, they need to be not only professionals, but also leaders. And I think that work that we are doing, the Empower program, the, uh, the impact statement, that we are receiving very good feedback from uh, from employers that are saying we are really looking forward for you graduates. you graduates and I think to me this is such an important thing because if you view and it is an investment if you view your study here as an investment your parents are doing the same I think the fact that you you have a, a world-class degree that will get you into a, a, a good employability a good job and to be respected and well received by employers and be supported uh, throughout this this um, time. Uh, time absolutely and uh, providing you with the flexibility and the peace of mind while you know amidst all of this uncertainty i, I believe this is something that we are all proud of mm -hmm. and we will continue uh, to provide to our students and dennis i don't know if you add anything I think you, you have covered most ground. I just like to add that we continue to invest in our learning and teaching technology as well. So platform is one. We also now uh, invest in uh, globally invest in a software called Key Server. Right. So th with this software, you can actually assess any labs on campus, and it's not just this campus. It's Edinburgh campus, and when Dubai campus is ready, they can also assess any PC of Dubai campus. This, this is like a new uh, provision that we have now made available. It will be launched soon. Uh, so this is just a sneak preview if you like, but then very soon you'll hear about it from IS. So really uh, people have been not only academic, but professional services staff have been working around the clock, make sure they add value to your education uh, in here at Hyderabad University. Are there any special aids that student can request, request for? if they have been impacted uh, negatively 
yeah. by the pandemic and then is this who, who should they reach out to for help there is a uh, one what fund that launched globally i think this was launched quite some time ago when the pandemic uh, i mean probably one month of the pandemic has begun uh, there will be some funds for students um, uh, you know a small fund for them to purchase some uh, you know things that they require for the daily life um, or if you are stranded for example we have used utilized this fund to help two of our study abroad students who are stranded in another right. foreign country uh, for privacy issue i can't disclose all the details but we managed to get them back and subsidize part of the uh, journey so there are funds definitely available for hardships uh, uh, caused by the pandemic uh, they need to reach out to uh, ssc uh, or SSS student support services, um, you know, at the first instance to, to inquire about this fund. If you're still confused about who you want to reach out to in from the university side, you can always come to Humsa first yes. um, for, for any yeah. anything that you have in mind. But um, what about what about tuition fees? Uh, the specific example that the question gave was uh, how about installment payments or pushing back dues? Um, because uh, previously, we have a sort of a gate in place. If you don't pay your fees, you are not allowed access to vision. So, so uh, is there any discussion around this? Yeah, they, were, they are now... Uh, um, this is actually not new. Mm-hmm. Before the pandemic, we already had installment schemes available for um, uh, students who require that kind of facilities. Um, uh, since the pandem- pandemic has begun, our finance uh, department has been working very closely to uh, uh, get financial aid for our students. For example, there is now a bank loan that you can um, apply, for. apply for without any collaterals. Mm-hmm. And we work very closely with Mayor Bank to make this possible for our students. There's also now a credit card payment scheme that you can pay your fee upfront using credit card and then divide that into installment of 12 months for, for, for your convenience. So that is also being put in place now, uh, ready to go for any students who require that kind of facilities. What about international students' fees? Um, there's a, I wouldn't say disparity, there's a difference, significant difference when it comes to local student fees and international student mm. fee. What causes that difference? I'm not sure who I should address this question to. Well, I, I can start and, and Dennis yeah. has, uh, can... Uh, so for for international students to uh, to uh, to come, uh, there are definitely uh, things related to visa and, and and so on. So these are these are part of the part of the international uh, uh, fees difference and EMGS cost and, and things like that. But at the same time, the Ministry of Education has really limited the capacity of the private institutions to raise the fees on uh, national uh, um, locals, locals, you know, nationals of Malaysia. So, so that's why I think it is. Uh, it's not something specific to to Malaysia. If you go to any country, including the UK, you will see that locals would pay a, a different um, a different price compared to uh, to the um, you know to the international students. So this is what I have to say. Yeah, and the price differential in Malaysia is really 10 to 50 percent at the moment, and we try to keep it, uh, you know, at at, at a you know, try to close the gap as much as possible. I will read this out flat because I think this is something I I cannot say would, would be the. I'm an international student currently studying in Malaysia. My home country currently currently it's in lockdown, and my family faces challenges. In sending money over for my tuition fees, what should I do? Contact the finance department, uh, reach out, and then we would uh, offer you support at, on the one case to case basis. So everybody has a different uh, scenario. We really need to understand a bit more rather than giving you a blanket solution. So reach out to the finance department, and you know they, they will advise accordingly. I think this is really a good advice. So if you are facing any difficulty financial or otherwise, please let us know. And let us know as early as possible and we will do our level best to support you. The first point of contact, if you don't know who specifically to reach out to, will be Humsa and we will provide you with the support that we can. And if you know which department 
you can send your email to. You have Mushtaq's promise that we, the university will try our best to support you financially or otherwise. So I would like to plug Pumsa just a bit. That we, we, we will be there for you. So uh, we can, we can I, I'm not sure whether site's on there, but we can share our website or our contact info. Please let us know if you are facing any difficulties. Not just us, Pumsa, or your personal tutor is something yes. that that is actually looked at right now and, and it's undergoing a revamp. I'm not do you want to share a bit about what personal tutor would be like for the next year? Yeah. Uh, again this is uh, being worked on globally. It's a global approach for uh, personal tutoring revamp. So there are now online um, materials for personal tutors. There are handbook they are fully digitized. We talk about we increase the frequency of touch point. So we also uh, also give more guide uh, to personal tutors in terms of uh, how to signpost accordingly, how to offer the right advice to students. So uh, really, first uh, personal tutors is a very unique um, uh, offering that Harawat is uh, you know organizing for all students. Uh, we are also trying to allocate personal tutors before the semester begin. So that's one thing that the schools are still working on. Um, so in any case, if you need help, please do reach out um, to your personal tutor. Academically, uh, uh, if you are having any issues at all, please reach out to them. If you have no academic matters, also reach out to them and they will be able to signpost you to the right place or uh, uh, give you the right advice on uh, maybe the well-being services or other departments uh, in the university that will be able to help you. I will talk about Empower because this is sort of a passion, your, your passion project. Um, is there anything different this coming year, very specific to the times that we are in? And I feel like throughout challenges like this, it's, it's how Empower as a program shines. Yes, you're right. So the, the, um, we are reimagining uh, Empower and we are working finalizing really the way we we are doing let's say the impact statement so the impact statement is the cornerstone of empower as you as you know so this is the part where you know you examine your values examine yourself and then develop a statement of how you would like to use your magic your existence your studies to uh, to make the world a better place through all of that um, so we are providing that entirely digitally so that and we would there will be elements of it that could be done face to face but for those students who will be you know either overseas or opted to to do it online we will do that um, uh, 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 online uh, we are actually also working with the duke of edinburgh award so that the same um, work that's being done for empower would be captured so that our students will achieve a certain level of Duke of Edinburgh uh, award. So it's it's really exciting. Uh, Dennis, I don't know if you have anything else to add in, in Empower Space. Yeah, I think also uh, we are trying to integrate the two schemes as seamless as possible. Um, we, uh, in terms of impact statement training, this is really what we are working on really hard right now. Um, there will be online modules to help you to prepare and we will try to do this in small group. So previous year we tried to do this in big classrooms yes. simultaneously. Now, um, you know, we try to do this as personalized as possible to really tease out the passion, the purpose that students mm -hmm. may have and how do we align that with Sustainable Development Goals uh, SDG. On RBL, the student asks, can we choose to do both online tutorials as well as face-to-face -face tutorials? If they feel like one class is not enough and they want to go more. Uh, first of all, um, the seat for face-to-face -face are really, really precious because of the uh, lockdown, uh, sorry, so, so, uh, because of the SOP, we have, the, uh, we have reduced the capacity in our classroom. So really, if you are given a face-to-face -face, uh, classroom uh, seat, please do make use of it fully. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to attend the online small group teaching, as I'm referring myself to refer them to tutorial, uh, please let your um, uh, academic staff know. I'm sure they will welcome you. 
but you have to understand that the primary uh, audience will be the online students who do not have the privilege to come to the uh, uh, you know face-to-face uh, -face classes so uh, probably you know the more personalized approach will be targeted on those who do not have physical access and that to ensure that they will receive the same amount of um, you know uh, attention as well yeah. so but, but the bottom line we will try our level best yeah. to accommodate our students. Yeah. So if a student wants to really learn and needs to do it twice, one class is not enough. Yeah. Go, go. We will do our level best to 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 see what kind of demand and how can we meet it. That's that's really our promise. Yeah. So um, are we able to attend online lectures conducted by global campuses? If yes, how are we going to join the lecture and do we need to inform the lectures before joining? Uh, the um, Really, um, the, like I said to you that uh, I take, for example, my own course. I'm delivering a course in uh, Year 3 um, Electrical Engineering. So in my course, not for you I know, but I have about a group of students that is watching this. Uh, so I'll be seeing them in my class. So uh, at the same time, I'm not only teaching Malaysia students because you have a group of about 100 Chinese students that are now, you know, depending on the chartered flight status, may not be arriving at Edinburgh in time for the lecture. So because they are in my time zone, I will be, uh, you know, happy for them to join my online classes. So, uh, so it's that kind of arrangement, because if you want to wake up late at night to join the other uh, group classes, remember that they also have capacity issue. Of course, uh, you need to talk to the course team globally to make that kind of arrangement. Uh, in terms of global synchronized lecture, meaning to say that you know it's one lecture um, activity Fortune that campuses. either Malaysia is delivering or Dubai is delivering or Edinburgh is delivering, uh, those are very limited because of the golden hours that we have. It's right. probably five to about eight o'clock at night. You know, beyond that, it's too late for Malaysia uh, students uh, any, uh, anyway. So we wouldn't want our students who has early nine o'clock classes to stay late at night to attend global lectures. So that those golden hour slots are very precious. They will be depending on the course that, uh, uh, you know, it's not pervasive that every course will do that. Right. So it has enough slot. And as I said that, you know, this is blended learning and really the focus is how the student learn and not how do we uh, teach as in when we preach. I have a question here on campus access, but I believe uh, you have given given your thoughts on this, so I will reiterate what you have said. Yeah. So please correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. Yeah. So students will be allowed access to facilities. Uh, say start October, un unlimited access to, to the facilities from eight to six p.m. So that's uh things like your three six five wish IT group study library, uh, student common five with your pool tables and Happy whatnot. Cafe. Very important, have cafe and the other uh, chicken rice shop and and that. So so you start October. So we are also pending on SOPs from the government, but but for now the understanding is uh, start October you will be able to come back regardless. But the the complication now is with the two weeks in September. So we are splitting it down to Group A and Group B students. So. The, the quick answer is no, you will not be allowed back on campus on days that you don't have face-to-face -face teaching. But this only is, for two weeks. Yeah. This is a, with a very big banner on top only for September. Am I right? Yes, I think so. yes, yes. And I would just like to point out what if I, I don't have conducive environment to study at home and, and I feel like campus uh, being on campus helps me to study or focus better. The, all the study spaces will be open. And, right. and um, you know, if you need a place to do online studies and we have upgraded our Wi-Fi for that purpose, we now support Wi-Fi 6 for those of you who understand what it is. Uh, so it means it's uh, really, really fast, but provided your device will support Wi-Fi 6, okay? <laughs> so so that really, if you need video connect, video lectures and stuff, like that, uh, please do feel free to use uh, one of the study spaces uh, for your study. Uh, if in the month of September, I'm not assigned to Monday, but I want to come back on Monday because I don't have, say, Wi-Fi in my accommodation. Would, would I be allowed back on campus if that is the case? Um, we 
do need to be careful on that, but just let us know if you need really need to come back and then we will work out whether to let you know whether we can support you. This is the questions for community. So it's for clubs and societies and for houses. It's mainly about Hunsa's operation. So uh, are in-person meetings for clubs and societies still encouraged? So there are now uh, procedures, SOPs in place for all of that. And the idea is if we have one meter uh, distance and we are now asking for every meeting room and that was in the uh, Together We Can Stay Safe video, we are expecting the people who are meeting, choosing to meet face to face, to clean, we write the wipes and the, we, to clean the facilities before they join, before they start the meeting and after they start the meeting. So. If we are able to follow this, then it's it's entirely uh, up to you. Uh, you. You could choose to do, so we won't encourage any specific form of meeting, right. because there are people who would prefer to do this uh, online, and that's entirely their choice. Uh, but we understand that there is a, a dimension that's being missed if we are not together. And when this happens, uh, then the, we, we um, we are confident that our community will abide by these uh, uh, rules and uh, SOPs because through them, we will all uh, be uh, safe and uh, we, we need to abide by them. So that's that's really the situation. Will there be big changes to the activities that we can do? Uh, also, will Kung Cup be happening this coming year? So I think this, uh, this is a question more for me rather right. than yes. for you. But the short answer is yes. However, in view of the current situation, current pandemic, and it's it's very volatile, um, we are putting steps in place to sort of help to reduce risk. Um, again, there will be a launch coming soon, but the sneak peek would be um, semester one, the main activities we will be focusing on are virtuals. And hopefully by the time we can come back on sem SEM2, and where we can go back to more face-to-face -face activities, we can do more face-to-face -face activities. So for now, most of the things are virtual in Sam 1 because I don't want to be the one that is responsible for a cluster in here. And I think uh, our students' health and well-being yes. is the utmost priority in whatever we do. That's right. right. So this is sort of our Kumsas principle when, when uh, for, for the coming semester, the, the line that we'll be looking to when we are organizing or say approving or, or rejecting your event application. This is the line that we'll be looking into. The next question is sort of very simple. Will we have online recorded online lectures? Yes. And all, all small class activities uh, that is conducted online will be recorded and oh. you can access to them and be played back multiple times and they will be deleted one um, at the end of the academic year. So that the next batch, you know, will not have the same material. Right. Yeah. So this is for data protection. Right. Also, your, your privacy. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts on what the work Kumsa is doing? What are your thoughts on clubs and society, specifically on a student's experience in a university life? Well, first of all, my, my thoughts on Kumsa, Kumsa and all our student bodies are very important part of our community. We have this um, uh, student partnership agreement because we see our work even before the, the pandemic as a partnership between us and our and our students and um, we are uh, really pleased to see Homsa taking the lead organizing chats uh, like this this is this is fantastic and we need more uh, of now when it comes to clubs and societies I believe they are a very important platform for our youth to build leadership skills, self-confidence, build their social capital and build their networks and we will definitely support it uh, as much as we can following the principles that you outlined. It needs to be safe, the well-being of our community, staff and students is, is taking uh, care of. So uh, I think we have uh, uh, quite a number of clubs and societies and uh, we also say if you would like to introduce something new, I'm sure Homsa is also open uh, for, for that. And um, they add true color and true flavor to our uh, community and we are very proud of it. Your thoughts on 
clubs and society on on a sort of students growth in university life yeah i, I think volunteering is definitely a big part of the student life and it's the whole reason why we started empower program so that we will put, capture this in a structure that students can actually uh, appreciate what what this is uh, doing for them big part of the strategy 2025 is also to look at whether there is a global kind of structure that we can put in place to help to uh, highlight the importance of volunteering i think that is also one part of student partnership agreement last year um so uh for me personally i'm a big uh, fan of you know student club and society i really appreciate uh, students leading the initiative so to, this morning i was talking to a reporter i talk about how the data science student um, uh, chapter have organized a data science forum on their own initiative he was so surprised he said that how do you manage to get your students to to take that kind of initiative i said actually not only that club the accounting club also organized a forum all on their uh, initiative so this is what i see that the students uh, lab initiative were actually like much as the app flavor and really this is what makes the place happening so the student life can be as vibrant as you want it to be it can be as planned as you want it to be so i really encourage all students to be taking part in home stars uh, activities if there's no activities that you like organize one I think that we even have anime club. Uh, uh, it, it's not just anime. Yeah, yeah. Uh, C A C G anime cinema and games. Yeah. I mean, Sai, please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm sorry if I get your name wrong. But I think it, I think I'm right. It's A C G anime cinema and and. Yeah. And also we have like you know, I I said you know yeah, I said. throughout the pandemic I see I said doing so so many fantastic things to yeah. social uh, community services. And I kept on seeing them on LinkedIn, and I just really, really thank uh, you know thank them for it for taking the lead in in making a difference in people's life. And now the engineers without borders, they are creating a bio digester, uh, which is again impacting you know rural communities. Uh, it's really, really wonderful to to be seeing. And that project is actually funded by the Empower Grant, available for all students to apply. Do you want to talk about Empower Grant? Uh, yes, I, uh, I I would like to do that. So uh, you, you guys know that Empower Program takes you in four stages of knowing and leading self to leading teams, leading uh, communities and leading enterprise. And uh, we have put aside some money if you have projects that will specifically help you and help your teams achieve the uh, Empower Point so that you can complete that and you can bid for, 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 these, for these projects. The only condition is the project needs to first be aligned to your impact statement. And secondly, it has a clear impact on either a team or a community uh, out there. And I think the example of using the waste to create cooking gas, which is the biodigester, was a, 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 a good example for how we can use our passion, our impact, and our knowledge as well to make a real difference uh, in the world. We also made the, uh, the funding available for um, final year uh, projects and uh, students who would like to apply for additional funds so that they could take their uh, final year project, again, align it. This is a must to their impact statement and uh, make the outcome impactful to the to the community to the world then we are very happy to uh, to support that as well right um before i move into a quick summary of the session is there anything else that you would like to tell the student to expect or, or, or words of encouragement or of hope to the student for the next academic year uh, absolutely I, uh, I i mentioned this i want to repeat it again this state is going to pass and they say Tough times will pass, but tough people will remain. And I think this is very important as you think of your studies and as you think of the difficulties that you are facing to always reframe them as opportunities. Whatever difficulty that you may be facing, travel, financial, learning, see how is that going to make you a better in individual. And we need you, the world needs you to lead on the recovery. I really mean that. 
Okay, mm-hmm. I'm a photographer, and as well as an engineer, I think life is very much like photography. You no, know, we need to focus on the positive and develop for the negative. I know you don't develop <laughs> negative anymore, yeah. uh, but uh, this is. Uh, I hope this will cheer you up a bit. Yeah. But the more most important thing is, uh, you know, stay safe, and we're really looking forward to have all of you, those who can come back I, uh, on campus, and those who can't, we'll see you online in September. Uh, don't worry about your learning and teaching. We have, we've got it covered. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on? The assessment process for for say what what um uh, E because you are teaching E can can you give us a sneak peek of what uh my grades would look like? Oh, okay, I, I think you're talking about whether you know you, uh, there will be um, a, a graded uh, assess. Well, the, sorry, the pro- final pro- result will be graded. Uh, so Ab- we we did some um you know um, um necessary measures to relieve. Uh, staff and students from anxiety and workload of uh, professional services staff across uh, all campus, also academic staff for marking. So uh, last year we said that the uh, first year we do not have final exam and you, uh, everybody will be getting a P and that is a temporary measure and for this year uh, we are now fully prepared so all assessment will be uh, you know part of your final grades. So most uh, courses will have a, a final assessment or an alternative take uh, uh, exam, for example, um, either a project or a continuous assessment. So all each course team will have, uh, you know, they know what is best for the uh, course, and they will let you know during the first of two. Uh, second oh, so, so it's different for each school and each course. Yes, of course. Uh, for uh, but then you will still get a grade A, B, C, D, and E towards the end of the semester. But things that I can expect are like group projects, uh, uh, a weekly quiz, or a regular quiz. That depends on the course thing. There will yeah. be formative part of the course. There will be summative part part of the assessment as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, when can students expect that briefing to happen? Uh, first week during the uh, or returning students is uh, uh, from seven of September. Uh, where you started to have your small group uh, synchronous lectures. So this will be briefed in the orientation pack. Okay, now I'll move into a quick summary for the session. So RBO is something that is here to stay and it's not just a response to COVID-19 and the pandemic, but rather to something much bigger. It's, a, it's, a, our, it's part of our strategy 2025 to have a digital core learning and teaching. And again, this is here to stay. It's not we, we switch it on, pandemic, and then switch it off. Yes. And the core of RBL is to help students to learn how to learn and to give them the drive to, to pick up learning themselves. And also the flexibility and the peace of mind. And that too, yes. um, because of the pandemic, responsive blended learning to allow students to, to re- revert back to the stage in MCO and, and go back to face-to-face very flexibly, right? On, on campus, uh, on, on site learning and, learning and teaching, on site access. The students will be allowed access uh, liberally in the month of October, in line with current SOP set by the government. Um, for the month of September, however, you will be partitioned into Group A and Group B. Group A students from uh, EPS, Aegis foundation. and Foundation. Uh, and in Group B, Max and Source. So this is a step to comply to the 30% cap capacity. Of uh, the number of the 30% per- per- cap, it's 1,200 students yes. on, on camp. Uh, no, 1,200 personnel yes. on campus at any given time. So this is up only in September. On that note, would so, um, can a student choose to not come back for September? and to wait until October or everything actually blows over, settle down to return to campus? Short answer is yes, they can, but we would like, you know, if you can return to campus, please do come back and because there's nothing that beat the human connections and, 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 and also to make this place, you know, uh, vibrant again. And we very love to see all students. And actually there are a group, uh, many group of students who can't wait to return to campus. They are already working on their projects on campus. Uh, right. they, they apply for permission to come back um, as you have met them uh, earlier on uh, yes. uh, over lunch. Right. And also on the topic of online learning, uh, we are using Vision and BBCU for breakout rooms and the more 
interactive part of online online sessions. Um, the promise is that students that are studying fully online because you are unable to come back will not be compromised. Your experience will not be compromised. And our, the, the promise is that you will be given um, the, the tools that you will need to proceed through the, cro- the yes, course. Yes. And on the topic of fees, it's not that the uni- university is not willing to give discount. Rather, uh, there are costs involved to keep the university afloat during trying times. But the university is trying their best to add value to the, to the money that you're paying to things like uh, uh, RBL, it's something that we are working very hard on. And then I believe, because I was involved with some of the discussion, and I feel like the, the existence of RBL gave a lot more work for staff. And, and for staff that are seeing this, I would just like to say I appreciate your hard work and thank you for your contribution. Um, um, it's, it's, I, I feel like it's very important to point out uh, if you understand how many, how much work that a staff has to put in just to digitize whatever you'll be seeing on, uh, on, on RBL, on, on your online big group study, you, you would appreciate your lecturers more. And they have been going through a, a, a training course throughout the summer to get them up. training course. Yeah. Yeah, actually, Carlos, thank you very much. That was very kind of you to to thank our uh, our uh, our academic and professional services staff, but even our uh, janitorial team and our yes. cleaners, because these will be the people who will be cleaning all the surfaces and the doorknobs twice a day, and and all of that is while it's you know maybe I'm mentioning it because it's the cost, but also the the work and the effort and the uh, dedication that everyone is putting in and the investments so that the campus is ready, is clean, is safe, the internet is right, your lecturers have the tools to support you. So all, all of that really costs uh, uh, quite quite a bit. Yeah. And uh, we would like to reiterate that if you are facing any difficulties, any challenges, reach out to any of us, reach out to Pumsa, reach out to SSS, SSC. And again, the promise is we will try our very best to help you succeed and to find the best version of yourself through your time here with Here at Work. Also on the topic of uh, moving forward after after the session, what should you be doing is to pack your bags. And yes. <laughs> I've said that for you. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's to pack your bags and get ready to be, to be on on site and start your next academic year. Ready to be inspired. Wonderful.